Hello, everybody. Welcome to Coffee Time with Byron. I am your host, Byron. This is episode number 74. Alongside me via live on YouTube, Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, you name it, available next day, but live right now on YouTube. We got former major leaguer, Mike DeJean, formerly of the Rockies. How are you tonight? Good. How are you? Hanging in there. Hanging in there. I know it's <laughs> all crazy. I know even with this whole virus thing still going about, this new format, whatever it is, you know, this, you've got, you think it would be Corona 22 right now, don't you think? With all right, that's periods? right. Yeah, it's kind of like we're, 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 uh, we're getting used to the new norm, you know, we, we, what are they going to name the next one and how bad is it going to be? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is crazy. Like, it's, you see, it's affecting everything. You see, it's affecting everything. It's affecting sports, it's affecting life. It's, it's, like, it's like, geez, can't, we can't, it's like, there's no norm no more. That's right. like on out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, we just got to, you know, hopefully everybody can stay healthy and eat right and take good vitamins and take care of themselves and hopefully it'll pass them by. I bet you you would have hated. I bet you you would have hated to play like the players with no fans. A couple. Oh, years. No, I, yeah, that would have been that would have been horrible. I can't. I can't imagine. That would have felt like practice to you. Right, e- energy from the crowds. It's like being on the backfields and spring training or something with nobody there. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, yeah. I I don't see how they were managed. I know they got paid for it, but I mean, for that, I you you would think it would have to be weird. I mean, I can't. I wouldn't. I couldn't imagine playing. I know the background noise and all that was different, but I don't think even that helped the players. Right. It had to feel like scrimmage. Yeah. You know, and as being a fan, I mean, you could actually, you know, hear the ball come off the bat, you know, and yeah. hearing guys hit the bag, you know, it was kind of, you, you, you did get some sounds that you normally didn't get as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was weird, but, but back to, uh, Back to before we get back into that little bit of what's happening now with that. I gotta ask you. I know you don't. I know you don't. Uh, you didn't have to deal with this when you played because you just beat it before it happened in '94. The strike with the players and the owners locking out. How, how do you see this coming about? Do you see progress being made? I mean, I think so. I mean, they've made progress and they've met more week more times this week than they have since the whole lockout. So when do you think we'll actually get going to playing ball again? Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I was in the minor leagues when, when the, uh, you know, when the strike happened back in 94 and all, and um, you know, there was no work stoppage when it, when I played and uh, you know, I think the, the players association leadership was solid. And, you know, I think uh, you know, the owners and the commissioner, you know, they saw how well the game was doing I do not expect there to be a delay in any spring training or anything like that. So um, I would expect them in the next week or so, you know, to iron some things out and, uh, you know, get an agreement that everybody can live with. And, uh, you know, it's just foolish to take away the game from the fans, you know, and that's, that's what everything revolves around. So I think they understand that. And I think they're going to get something done pretty quick. Now, what do you think that's all based on? Do you think it's because the players are partly being greedy? Do you think the owner, I, the owners are being greedy? What do you, what you as a former player? I know you just like you said you missed it, but what, what is it? What is it on both sides being greedy? What is it? I don't understand. Well, I, I, I'm not sure, but I haven't followed it. Oh, you know, I haven't looked at the nuts and bolts and what they're arguing about and what they're wanting and you know and all of that. Um, you know. I mean, the bottom line is it's going to be money. You know, that, that's just the bottom line. It's going to be money. So, um, you know, they just have to find a happy medium. You know, we're, we're you know, the players are making, you know, a lot of money now. Um, you know, and they have, you know, whatever their window of opportunity is, they've got to be able to jump in and out of that window as many times as they can. You know, and then, of course, you have the injuries. You know, you have one injury and your career's over and everything. So guys want to certainly make money, you know, to take care of themselves and their family for, for years to come. But, um, you know, it comes to a point where I think as a player, you say, all right, well, we, we, when we're going to play ball or we're going to sit here and haggle over money. So, you know, and keep the game from the from the fans. And, you know, now 
that's all I am anymore. I'm a fan. You know, I just get to, I get to get to watch it, you know, and teach it a little bit, but I don't get to play it anymore. So um, I think cooler heads are going to prevail. I think they're doing that right now. And I wouldn't be surprised in the next week or so they have it all ironed out and have to have the money figured out what they're trying to do. Now, what's before we get into your career, let's talk about the team that came out of nowhere that uh, just like the nationals did in 2019, where they were last in the division come summertime. Let's talk about the Braves. Did you see that coming where they won, where they would win the World Series last year after seeing them come from nowhere, literally nowhere, come trade deadline? Yeah, they, um, you know, you know I mean, they had, you know, they had some off the field issues. You know, they, they lost one of their best players. You know, it was, um, you could see that they had still had pieces in place that could win day in and day out. But I think what they did, uh, you know, for the trade dot deadline and everything, you know, to me at that time of the season, obviously it's whoever's the hottest, whoever's playing the best ball. Um, but I think their team chemistry, you know, if you think about the Red Sox, when the Red Sox, you know, got back on top of the world series, that's all I can remember about those teams is that team chemistry just seemed to be phenomenal. And that's what it seemed like with the Braves this year. You know, they were hot. Um, guys were having fun, playing loose. And I think that's obviously what it takes, you know, when you're in high-pressure situations. You know, you have teammates that are, you know, are able to, you know, bring you back down to earth and keep you in the moment and everything. Uh, you know, I think the chemistry the chemistry and playing great ball, uh, you know, was ultimately what helped the Braves win this year. Now, did you have – now, obviously, you were a journeyman. You were for five different teams, Colorado twice. Did any of those teams come close to making it like what the Braves did to the World Series? Like where you guys were like underdogs? Like no, I, you know the the closest I believe the closest I was to making it to the playoffs. Well, it probably was twice. Um, I'm not sure how far we out were in 2003 when I finished with the Cardinals, um, and then 2004 or so when I was with the Mets. It seemed like we were you know a few games off the wild card. So. Um, I never had the, uh, the the opportunity or the privilege to play in a, in a uh, any of the playoff games or whatever. But um, of course, that's a you know, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> no, no, um, you know, I never I never really got close to you know getting to the playoffs. Well, I'm sure I'm sure that I had to ache you as a player. But like you said, there's nothing you can do, especially if you're not on the right team, the right situation. There's nothing you can do, right? That, that's mean, right. Yeah, you just. You know, it, it, uh, you know, it, it's hard to get to the playoffs. Yeah, you know, it is. Back then yeah. or now, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You have to, you know, you have to have a lot of things go right. People stay healthy and, you know, pitcher have career years and hitters have career years. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's hard to get to the playoffs year, year in and year out. I'm just surprised your first three years with the Rockies, they had good teams. I know they were, they were just uh, coming into a franchise. But still, regardless, you guys had good players. You had Vinny Castilla. You had yourself. You had a, c- plenty of you, plenty of good players on that team. And it's just some. I guess you you just couldn't beat the uh, Padres. Were up there. The Marlins. Yeah. It, it's it was, like you said, tough. It, yeah, the Braves, for example, with the with the big three. Right. So, yeah, I mean that I I agree with you. It's just and plus whoever comes out hot too, like you said in the season, right? It's a matter of who comes out hot. Yeah, my my first go around with the um with the Rockies from '97. I was traded the third day of the season in 2001, but um, you know it was a different animal. Um, you know that they hadn't raised the walls or anything like they have now, uh, but there was no humidor either. So right, uh, you know it was it was a challenge, you know, to pitch there. It was a challenge to get, you know, a good two seam sinker to bite. And it was a challenge to get a curveball and, and uh, sliders to bite and everything. So, you know, it was just a, a, you know, it was a war of attrition. You just had to just pound the strike zone, try to keep the ball down. Um, you know, if you give up a solo shot, whatever, cause we're probably going to get one too, but, you know, try to keep the damage down as far as not walking people and, uh, you know, and all that. So, and you know, that ball, that ballpark's so big. There's so much grass out there for the ball to land on anyway. Um, you know, so, you know, the humidor came around. I think it, t- it tamed Coors Field down just a little bit. Um, but, you know, it still doesn't take away the fact that the ballpark is, you know, is so big. There's so much area 
you know, for the outfielders to cover. Now, before you got drafted, you played Division II college at Livingston Community, uh, and you went to the World uh, World Series Division II World Series that year. What do you remember about that year? Because it says you pitched, you pitched in that World Series, and you retired both the batters you faced. So, what do you remember most about that year coming out of Livingston Community College? Well, well, we, you know, we were division two, you know, it's called, it was back then it was called Livingston university. Now it's called university of West Alabama. Um, you know, we, we had, uh, a, a really big athletic team. We had, you know, everybody on the team seems like they were, you know, six, two or bigger and, you know, two, two fifteen or better. But, um, you know, we, we had, we had, good strike throwing starting pitchers. You know, we didn't really have anybody overpowering, but we just had guys that pounded strike zone and we had really good defense, you know, and, you know, then at the plate, we had guys that, you know, could pound the baseball and hit it out of the ballpark and run well. So, um, you know, as far as, you know, we stacked up against a, a lot of, you know, uh, division one schools. We just didn't obviously have the numbers, you know, we didn't have the roster numbers and everything. So, um, you know, what I remember about the, the world series, you know, um, it was, you know, I had, I had actually gotten into a heated discussion with my head coach Mm -hmm. about pitching, um, because we were, you know, needing a little bit of help, I guess. And, um, so next thing you know, you know, he has me out there pitching and I did real well. And, you know, I got a few innings there going into the playoffs and everything. And then in the world series, uh, he wanted me to come in and get two outs to save the game. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of when the scouts jumped on my arm. You know, they saw my arm strength. They saw the action in my fastball and slider and everything. And, you know, uh, almost overnight, I went from playing shortstop to being a pitcher. So, yeah, you, you just led me to my next question. Yeah, I see that you started out as a shortstop. So what what the, what the hell happened? What made you were you just well, good as a shortstop? What the hell happened there? Yeah, well, you know, and I was drafted by the Yankees, and I always I take pride in that. You know, I still follow the Yankees, and I like the Yankees and everything. And you mm-hmm. know, they like they say, once a Yankee, always a Yankee. But yeah. um, um, you know, I was drafted in the twenty fourth round. They give me one thousand dollars, and they let me know real quick that you know this your signing bonus. That's not what you're going to live off of. You know we need you to try to get to the big leagues. That's where you're going to make your money. Yeah. Um, you know, and they told me, they said, you're, you're, you're going to help us by either pitching for us, you know, in Yankee stadium, or uh, we're going to be able to trade somebody that we need, you know, for, you know, with you. So, and then I was traded for Joe Girardi, you know, to the Rockies. So go it, kind of, <laughs> it, it kind of worked. I got to pitch in Yankee stadium, but never as a Yankee, which I wish that would have happened too. So, um, yeah, so it's 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 funny, you know, it, that that organization, um, with all the World Series they've won, you know, and I was drafted in '92 with Derek Jeter, and there was, you know, several other, um, you know, one of my buddies, Mike Buddy, who who was out of Wake Forest, he's now the uh, athletic director for Army. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, that we had some really talented guys in that draft, and um, and and you know, most of these guys I played through all the way, you know, through. Uh, South Atlantic League and uh, Florida State League and Eastern League and all that, you know. So, um, you know, I've uh, I, I take a lot of pride in being drafted by the Yankees and going through, you know, a class act or an organization like that. Now, what was going on through your mind? Because, like you said, you brought that up, and I'm seeing it now too. Like you said, in the '95 season, you were traded for the Yankee legend Joe Girardi, yeah. who ended up being a Yankee legend before Jorge Posada. What was going on? What was going on through your mind when you found out you did get uh, get traded? Did you think your career was up, or did you want to go somewhere else? Well, and I, I, I my, you know, anytime you're, you know, anytime you're in Double A, Triple A, whatever you're in, you know, and I and I was still fairly young. Uh, anytime you're you're traded for a big leaguer, that is really good news, you know, because mm-hmm. you know they're obviously the Yankees were trying to fill a void. Uh, uh, in their bullpen, uh, you know, and of course I, you know, it, I had another year before I got to the big leagues, but, um, you know, mm-hmm. they, they obviously like my stuff and how it matched up into Coors Field, you know, uh, you know, anytime you're pitching in, in Coors Field, you want guys that throw, you know, sinkers that keep the ball down. So, um, you know, so I was, I was excited, you know, I, I, I was sad because I wasn't going to be with my buddies and have a chance to, 
you know, pitch for the Yankees or whatever at that moment. But um, I was I was excited because I knew that was no, another opportunity coming around, and and hopefully I was one step closer to being in the big leagues. So, like you said, you didn't make your debut until May second of ninety seven, where you pitched a scoreless inning against go figure Joe Girardi's former team that he managed the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember about your call up and did you have goosebumps? Did, did you, how, how'd it go? How'd it go? Yeah. Well, you know, there? Pa- Paul Zabella was my triple A manager in Colorado Springs. Um, you know, which is, you know, not far from Denver at all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was kind of on a, a, a rotation or not a rotation, but I would pitch every, three days or so, you know, no matter what, you know, and if it was my situation, I would pitch and, you know, you pitch a couple days in a row, then you got a day off or whatever. So they try not to wear anybody out. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was a day that, you know, I hadn't pitched in several days and I knew I was going to get an inning. Uh, Sonny Siebert was my pitching coach, which he was, you know, I mean, he's just an all time great guy, but as well as a great pitcher in the big league. So, um, well, I looked down to the, look down to the, to the dugout and I'm like, you know, waving my hand, like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to pitch. Right. And they kept telling me to sit down. Well, the game went on and we're, we're out of innings, you know, and I didn't get to pitch. And so I go into the clubhouse and um, I can't remember who told me, Hey, the, you know, Skip wants to see you in the office. And I go in there and Sonny Siebert's in there and Paul Zavella and he, uh, uh, Paul says, you know why you're not, you didn't pitch today. And I said, no, I said, I, I mean, I need to get some work in. He said, well, you're not, you didn't pitch tonight because you're going to be pitching at Coors Field tomorrow night. So I, I was, it was exciting. I was pretty fired up. I loved playing in Colorado. I loved living there. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, obviously a beautiful place, you know, and the, the people there were really, they were really good fans. You know, they were, of course, they were really hot for the Rockies back then and, and the Broncos were coming on and starting to do really well also. So um, it was, it was an exciting time. You know, I remember, you know, my first night in the big leagues, um, Don Baylor had a habit. You know, he he always tried to get the rookie guys in their first game as fast as he could. And, um, you know, Coors Field was just electric back then. You know, when, when you got to the mound, it was it was like it was so loud you could literally feel the ground moving while you're on the field. So um, I can't remember all the batters, but I do know that Mickey Morandini was the first guy that I faced in the big leagues, and he hit a line drive fly ball to Dante Bichette in left field. That, that was that, – now that you betcha him, I did not know that because he was another one that I had on my on my podcast recently too. M- Mickey was? Know. Yeah, I did not know he was your, one of your first uh, – Yeah, he's the first batter. He, he, was the, he was the first guy I ever faced in the big leagues. You know, he was – you know, he was that scrappy little left-hander. You couldn't strike him out. You know, he would bunt for a hit and hit for a yeah. double and steal yeah, bases. Was. So, yeah, he was. You're right. He was. He was scrappy. That's for sure. That's all his career was, and he had a good career. Yeah, that's the career. Yeah. Um, now that now that you mentioned it, I gotta ask you because you kind of led me on now to my next question. Like you said at the time, like you said, the Rockies were still a new team, but you guys had good players. But like you said, you were also competing with two other teams in Colorado. The Avalanche, who had a good team with Joe Sackick and I uh, forget, uh, forget their goaltender. Uh, oh, Roy, Patrick Roy. Patrick Roy, yeah. Yeah. And you had yeah, the Denver Broncos with Shannon Sharp, Terrell Davis, John Elway, all those guys. How difficult was it to compete with – those kind of teams because you guys were still fairly new even though you had tons of veterans you guys had that had to put a lot of pressure on you guys to perform to compete with their success the other team success that they were having in your state and your city i mean i don't know if it was i don't know if it put any added pressure on us you know because i really think it took you know it's taken a while for um you know the, the Rockies organization to, to figure out pitching and altitude and um, you know, and, and, you know, you know how you win there, you got to score runs, you know, and play really yeah. good defense, um, you know, but, and I think the humidor has helped a lot, but it, you know, it all, no matter where you're at, it's always going to start and stop with your pitching. You know, your pitchers have to be able to fill it up, have to control the zone, change speeds, keep the ball down 
And then the bullpen has to be able to come in and do the same thing. So, um, you know, I think probably one thing that not a lot of people talk about is, you know, it is physically a lot harder to play a sport in altitude. Uh, you know, and some guys it affects worse than others. But, um, you know, the recovery process is a lot slower. You know, uh, oxygen saturation, you know, in your bloodstream is, is not quite as good as it is at sea level and everything. So, you know, when I was – when I went from, from – in 2001, I went from Colorado, was traded to the Brewers. You know, it literally took me, you know, every day in the bullpen for almost a month to really get locked back in on, you know, where I had to start this pitch to, to keep it on the plate or how to break it off the plate and everything. So – um, you know, Coors Field is, you know, and it still is a really tough place to, to pitch and to win. Um, but I think the Rockies are getting closer and closer, you know, and they've made it to the World Series and everything. But, um, you know, it's 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 always going to be hard to pitch there. It's always going to be physically more physically demanding to pitch there than it will be anywhere else at sea level. Now, I saw you can correct me if I'm wrong here from what I have. It says you had the most success as a closer when you first became a closer for Milwaukee. Uh, what, what's your mindset compared to what you were because you were a relief pitcher? How, how much difference is it, or is there no difference at all, becoming a relief pitcher to a closer? Well, I, you know, I get, there is a difference, and there certainly is. a. a um, you know, you're, you, most closers – they probably don't have a safety net behind them. You know, I don't think Mariano had a safety net or ever needed a safety net behind him. You know, it, it was either going to be a win, a tie, or, or a loss if, when Mariano was pitching, you know. Not, not that I was anywhere in that league. But um, my, my mindset when I was pitching was always to get on the mound as fast as I could and get off the mound into the dugout as fast as I could you know, in getting out, it's not, not being knocked off the mound. So, you know, I don't know if my mindset changed very much at all. You know, I, I do know this, that whether you're a starter, um, a reliever, closure, whatever, you know, you're going to have to make adjustments from time to time, maybe from year to year or every other couple of years, you're going to either have to invent a pitch or do something a little bit different, you know, because the charts are so good. Tendencies are charted so well. They know what you're going to pitch, you know, if it's, two balls, two strikes, you know, in a day game and a slight drizzle, you know, they know all those numbers. So, uh -huh. um, you know, for me, you know, I, I had, I had a, a, a couple good years pitching in Milwaukee as a closer. Uh, I struggled there the last, and I think probably because people get used to seeing you, you know, they get to used to seeing you pitching in games and everything. And, you know, and I didn't make, you know, quite enough adjustments that I needed to make, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, you just, and, and you're, you know, and my, I pit, I had, you know, I pitched with some great catchers. I had some great catchers in every team that I was on. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that plays a lot into it too. You know, I never, I never took the mound and looked, looked at the plate and said, man, I wish that guy wasn't behind there, you know, and, and every team I've been, you know, the catcher for me was always just a boost of confidence, you know? So, um, you know, I didn't really, I it did not bother me. You know, if I got the save, then obviously that looks better you know, when contract time comes up, um, you know, but as you can see anymore, if you can bridge, you know, an inning or two thirds or whatever it is, or two innings to get to that closer, you know, those guys in the bullpen are, 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 are big reason why teams are winning or not winning. Now, unfortunately you, and for, I was born in the nineties, so I know about this era and you pitched in this era, the steroid era, when you mm -hmm. were out there pitching, I know you had to pitch against those guys that were accused of it and who came out and actually said they did it. Right. Um, but at the time, no, you going up against these guys, could you tell as a pitcher personally that they were juicing? Well, I mean, I could obviously tell, you know, I'm a fairly big guy. Um, I mean, you, you could see, you could see guys were a lot bigger, a lot, a lot more, you know, a lot more muscles, this, that, and the other, you know, but, um, I mean, it was one of those deals, you know, you, you still got to get him out. You know, they're, they're not, you know, he, he's, he's in front of you. He's at the plate. So there's nothing you can do at the moment. You just got to try to beat him to the punch and make your pitch. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you on that. That's true. And, but this is what I don't understand though, 
like with baseball though, and maybe you can help me out with this as a former player. At the time, though, there was no, if I can re- recollect, there was nothing against players taking that kind of stuff. So why are the voters keeping those guys out of the Hall of Fames if it was allowed for players to do that stuff? Because they weren't testing for that stuff back then. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I was, I've never been a sports writer, you know, so I don't know, you know, what that, uh, what that entails, you know, I, I was, I was a, a, a shortstop slash big league pitcher, you know, um, you know, it comes up every year in, in the world. I mean, in the, uh, in the hall of fame time, you know, when the voting comes out, um, I would think, and I'm not a judge, I don't judge people, but I would think from the beginning of Cooperstown opening up to this very moment, there's probably some not so good dudes in the Hall of Fame, you know, that have done a lot worse than taking a performance enhancing uh, drug, whether it was to get stronger to throw harder uh, or hit the ball further, or if they were taking it just to uh, be able to heal quicker you know, and stay on the field more, you know, what, whatever it was. Um, I think at some point in time, you know, those guys are going to have to sit back whether they want to or not. And, and I'm not the one to tell them to do it, but they're going to have to sit back and say, you know, we've got some of the best players in the history of the game that are not in the hall of fame. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have some people who are in the hall of fame that quite possibly could have taken a PED, you know, that, 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 nobody said anything about or nobody got caught because the way, you know, the social media, um, the cameras, everything is involved, you know, as far as, you know, how news, how fast news gets out, even for the last 20 years, not just the last few years, you know, um, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I can see both sides of the argument. I I'm one that I have never seen any, any evidence I haven't seen it written. I haven't seen it on TV. I haven't seen any evidence of, of Barry Bonds. There's been a lot of speculation, Um, you know, but if we went, if we went to trial in front of a jury under nothing but speculation, then, you know, I mean, that wouldn't make any sense, you know? So a guy like Barry Bonds in my eyes, you know, he, he was a a hall of famer before, you know, any of the PED stuff came out, you know, Um, I, I, I broke into the big leagues right around 200 pounds. You know, my last year, I was about 225, almost 230. So, I mean, I gained a lot of weight. Now, I probably didn't gain a bunch of muscle and everything. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, I can see both sides of argument, but I'm the I'm the guy, you know, I've always thought, like most people, that Pete Rose needs to be in the Hall of Fame, you know. And I really believe if Bart Giamatti wouldn't have passed away of a massive heart attack, um, Pete Rose would have been in the Hall of Fame. You know, I think yeah. Bart Giamatti would have, would have uh, opened the door for him to be reinstated back into baseball. Um, now, I don't know why he hasn't been, um, you know, but, you know, to have one of the, I mean, I mean, that guy was, that guy was the dude and he was, he, you know, he was a dude for many years on, on, on a lot of really good teams. So um, I don't know, you know, I think that, um, I think that in every major sport, there are guys who are doing, performance enhancing drugs that are in the hall of fame that just didn't get caught. Yeah, you're right on that. Uh, so now I got to ask you this. I had another guy, another Rocky fellow, uh, a fellow podcaster himself now for the Rockies. He played for Rockies as well. Um, I don't know if you play for him. You might, you might have, I don't remember. Did you play with a guy, a uh, fellow pitcher, uh, Mark Knudsen? I don't think I did. I remember his name, but no, I don't think we were ever teammates. Okay. I I just had to ask that because I had him. I had him. It was another Rocky pitcher, and he played around the same time you did. So that's why I had to ask that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um. So now I got to ask you, okay. So, yeah, we just had, like, we got into the Hall of Fame a little bit. Like you said, yeah, I think Pete Rose should be into Barry Bonds and them. Uh, obviously Ortiz was the only one to get in this year. I, I, I thought, I thought he should have gotten in and he did, but 
was there anybody else that you think that you played uh played for or played against that should be instead of the big names of Bonds, Clemens, Sosa, McGuire, all of them, is right. there anyone else that you think should have been in this year that should have gone? Yeah, I mean, there, there's 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 a few guys I can think of. You know, one one of them is a you know he was a, a, a dear teammate of mine and, and and still a friend is uh, Todd Helton. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Todd. I mean, he set the bar so high there for a few years, and you know. And it wasn't like he just did it at Coors Field. He did it on the road also. Um, uh, Fred McGriff. Fred McGriff's a big leaguer. I mean, he, he he's a big leaguer that 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 played for a long time. Hit a lot of big home runs. Great teammate. You know, great on defense. Um, he needs to be in Cooperstown. They need to put him in tomorrow. Um, Andrew Jones. You know, for for Atlanta. You mm-hmm. know the way that guy played center field. You know, and you think about it. The the time that I was playing. And, and I can't go back, you know, a long time. I'd have to get on a computer to look these guys up. But during the time I was playing, I'm not sure in the history of baseball if they had that many good center, that many great center fielders. Besides, you Griffey, know, yeah. Besides, I mean, yeah, yeah, Kenny Lofton, you know, Griffey. That's right, Andrew Jones. I mean, you know, Devon White. I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, so many great center fielders. Um, you know, during the time that I played, that. Um, you know, certainly a guy like Andrew Jones, you know, he, he's very worthy of being a Hall of Famer. Um, I really hope Fred McGriff gets in, too, you know, because he was he was fun to watch before I get in the big leagues. and He was fun to compete against. That's what also makes your position tough, too. You were a relief pitcher mainly. That's got to be a tough criteria, too, to also make the Hall of Fame. I, I don't I can't recall a relief pitcher besides closers make it into the Hall of Fame. Right, I, right. Well, I just don't get it. Why relief pitchers are? I know they pitch less, but yeah. I mean, well, and, and I don't know either. You know, um, you, you take like you take Raleigh Fingers. I mean, that guy was getting saves, and he was doing you know two or three innings. You know, yeah, and there yeah. wasn't one inning save back then. You know, and, and Goose Gossage and everything. So, you know, I, I mean, I am, I am not Hall of Fame material whatsoever. You know, and I would go out on a limb and say a lot of the guys that are in the hall of fame when they were rookies, they weren't thinking, man, I'll be in the hall of fame one day, you know, yeah. ma- maybe a couple did, but, um, you know, um, you know, the, I, I don't know. Maybe that's a good, that's a good, uh, a drum to beat on, I guess. Um, there, there's certainly some good relievers over the years, you know, that were set up guys or lefty specialists or whatever. Um, you know, but I don't know what numbers they would have to, dig up to to see who meets that meets it meets that criteria now do you have <coughs> besides your big league call up do you have a moment throughout your career that it was that you would define as your welcome to the big league moment god welcome to the big league moment um man i don't know because i i really I, I was one of those guys that every day I went to the ballpark. I, I mean, I, I did, I realized how special it was. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I, I don't know. You know, it was, you know, the 98 all-star game, you know, in Coors Field when I was there, you know, that was, that was really special to be there. Uh, get to see some of these old timers that I'd met when I was in the minor leagues, you know, um, man, I don't know. I, I just think, you know, when, when, when I was in the bullpen at Colorado, you know, we had uh, Darren Holmes, Mike Munoz, Bruce Ruffin, Steve Reed. You know, there was a there was an old guard there that did really good job of teaching young guys how to act and what they needed to do and what was expected of them when they're in the bullpen uh, and in the clubhouse uh, and everything. So um, I think that, you know, being in the bullpen with those old dinosaurs and having them accept me, and, uh, you know, and take care of me and care for me and all that stuff, you know, that, that made me feel really, really good. So, you know, there was a sense of security when I went to the bullpen, cause these guys that, you know, they had been through some battles and, and, uh, and had their scars and everything and, you know, had a lot of really good advice to give a young guy. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to give you some moments throughout your, I'm going to give you some moments that happened in baseball while, in, uh, while you were playing. Yeah, I want, I want you to answer where exactly at the moment that you may have remembered where 
where you were at this time because these were okay. big moments in baseball history. Yeah. First one is Cal Ripken, Cal Ripken Jr.'s – he broke the record for most consecutive games played. Right. Do you remember where you were for that moment? I, I do not, but I do I, – I was watching it on TV, but I cannot remember where I was. What year was that? I think it was 96 or 97. Yeah, so I was probably – I was probably either at Colorado Springs, you know, somewhere in AAA, or I was, you know, if it was 96, I was in AAA. I want to, I want to say 96. That, yeah, if it was 96, I was I in AAA, 96. but I do remember seeing it. You know, I remember seeing the big, you know, the big to-do at uh, Camden Yards. Um, the next one is the home run race chase between McGuire and Sosa in 98. Yeah. Right. So – when McGuire, when McGuire hit the home run in St. Louis, I was in Colorado at my house watching the game on TV. I think he hit off with Steve Traxel, didn't he? Yep. Yes, yep. he did. That's right. Well, figure the same one that gave up the the next the next one. I was going to say Barry Bonds, Barry Bonds record breaking one in 01. Right. So he so Traxel gave that one up too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. I, I remember seeing it, but I, I don't remember Steve being the pitcher. Yep, same pitcher. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It is. Um, so let's talk about now your your where you played the most. Obviously, was Colorado. I gotta yeah. ask you, um, because I'm sure you still sort of follow them. What do they need to do to get back into? into the playoffs because the NL West is a tough, the tough division. Yeah. could be the toughest in baseball, if not right. for the AL East. So yeah, what, that, do you, what do they that, need to do? Man, you know, the, the, the Padres are, you know, the Padres are getting close. You know, they're, 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 they're may, they may be one, they may be the team this, this coming season in the West, you know, the Dodgers, um, you know, they've, they lost Corey Seager, you know, they, they let him go to Texas. <laughs> they replaced him with Turner, who was a you know really really good ball player. Um, man, I don't know what Colorado is going to have to do. They're going to have to stay healthy, that's for sure. Um, you know, and and you're they're going to have to have guys have career years, you know, because the Dodgers, the Dodgers and the Padres, and of course the Giants are, are always in the mix. The Giants will always be right there. Seems like you know, um, you know, good minor league system, good scouting. You know, that's what it takes. But um, you know, I, I think the Rockies are. I think Bill Schmidt, he was my uh, my hitting coach in Oneana with the Yankees. I mm -hmm. think he's. I'm not sure if he's still interim manager, if they general manager, if they named him the full time general manager, or whatever. But um, you know, they they've got some good scouts in the good minor league system there too, and that's where it's going to have to happen. You know, uh, all these teams that are winning, you can look down their minor league systems, and they're doing really really well. So. Um, you know, the Yankees, I mean, the Rockies are going to need to have to, you know, they're going to have to bring these guys up or, 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 or trade them off and get guys in, you know, that they can keep for a long time and, and, and compete with the Dodgers and the, and the Padres and the Giants. So it's a two, my next question is a two-part question. Uh, what was your pitching repertoire and what was your most go-to pitch to get a, to get a hitter out? So I threw a sinker, a slider, and a fork ball. Um, you know, and if I if I need to get a strikeout, it was probably going to be you know trying to move a guy off the plate with a fastball and throwing a slider or a fork ball. Um, you know, I was really I was really always looking for the ground ball with my with my two seam with my sinker. I was looking to get that double play ground ball and get out of there you know with one pitch and two outs. So um, if I had to do my career over again. I would have thrown a lot more fork balls. You know, I'd have used my fastball, my four seam to move guys around, and I'd have used, I'd have thrown a lot more fork balls than I did. Now, obviously, you had a chance to before, before the stadiums updated themselves, which I like is much better now. I don't like the football and baseball sharing stadiums, yeah. but you obviously played in them. Did you hate that as a as a pitcher? Did you hate playing in those stadiums? Not, not were, really. I, mean, were, I, 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 I would I would have pitched every game every game we ever played in Candlestick. I would have pitched in if they would let me. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, the ball moves so good there at, from, from a pitching standpoint. <clears throat> and as a hitter, it traveled real funny because it seemed like that, you know, these guys would hit line drives in the gaps that would get out, and then they would hit a bomb real high, mm -hmm. like the winds up there would just knock it down. So, um, you know, look, Candlestick, you know, Oakland, that was a fun place to go. You know, it's, it's kind of different looking, um, you know, uh, the D old Dolphin Stadium. It was a little bit different looking, but, you know, they, they was cool. I, I mean, I enjoyed it. I didn't mind it at all. But is there, like, is there, like, a difference in how the ball travels, though? I mean, like you just said, I mean, I I, I, I couldn't tell the difference. I mean, I, I, watched a lot of, I watched a lot of baseball growing up, and especially in those stadiums compared right. to the baseball, I couldn't tell the difference. But was there, was there really a complete big difference compared to regular baseball? Fields? Well, was there a difference? I mean, the, the probably the ballpark that the, the wind affects the most, in in my opinion, would be Wrigley Field. Um, mm -hmm. When that wind's blowing in, man, you can throw belt high fastballs and let them hit it as hard as they want to hit it. They're not going to hit it out of Wrigley Field. On the other hand, if the wind's blowing out, you know, it, it'll you know a ball that's not here real well will go out. You know, so out of all the ballparks I've ever pitched in, Wrigley Field with the wind blowing out is you know that's the shortest ball field i've ever played on now can you give me a moment that you had that you remember most that you that you thought that you enjoyed that you enjoyed the most out of your career like say striking out somebody like uh ending a game or like if you when you were a closer is there a defining moment out of your career that that you remember the most well, I think, um, you know, I had just gotten traded to the to the Brewers in 2001. Um, we had – early on in the season, we had some starting pitching injuries and stuff. So, you know, our bullpen was getting depleted down. And I think the Giants came into town, and uh, I think I came in to pitch. It was like maybe the fourth inning, you know, because we were, we were scuffling to get guys out and, you know, trying to keep the game close and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, – you know, and I was the new guy in town, so I obviously was, you know, amped up wanting to, you know, pitch well for the Brewers fans. So um, I come in, um, and I don't remember the order, but it was J.T. Snow, Jeff Kent, and Barry Bonds. Ooh, and I came in and struck great. out. I struck out the side with the bases loaded, so I was pretty, I was pretty pumped up. <laughs> not many, not many can say that. Yeah, that, that was that was certainly walking, you know, walking on the edge of danger. Um. So then, so now I got I I got to ask you about another about another team that you played for that's somewhat been on the rise and then somewhat on the decline. You know mm -hmm. you don't know with them. I know you only play like a couple seasons with them. I see them on your pill uh, next to you, the pillow, the Mets. Yeah. What do they need to do? Because they're all they're they fluctuate every single year. It seems like they don't know what they want to do. Right. What do they need to do to get over that hump? Well, I, you know, there's been some managers fired from there in the recent years that probably didn't deserve that. Um, you know, they have Buck Showalter in there now, you know, and, and he's a really good guy, but he's a no nonsense manager. He, you know, the players are going to know what he wants and what he expects. Um <clears throat> You know, to really comment on the organization, you'd have to know what their minor league system looks like. And, of course, I don't follow it that close. Right. But, um, right. You know, the, the Mets and the Yankees fans, too, the, you know, both cities, you know, or the, the, the both teams in, the, in New York, um, they don't have a whole lot of patience. You know, uh, they, they want success now. Um, I don't know what the Mets are going to need to do. Uh, you know, they, they've got DeGrom, which that's, you know, you're kind of guaranteeing yourself 15 to 20 wins a year with him. But, um, man, I, I don't know. They, they, they've they got to get their pitching staff figured out. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. You know, they've got some really good young players on the field, um, you know, who are going to, you know, have to, you know, like, you know, what's the polar bear at first base? I mean, you know, he's going to have to hit 35 to – you know, 50 yeah. home runs a year, you know, he's going to have to keep maintaining that. And I'm sure he will because he's super, super strong, super talented player. But, um, you know, I'd love to see the Mets get back in there, you know, to you know, hopefully one day before I'm too old to, you know, be able to know what's going on, that, you know, the Mets and the Yankees being the World Series again, that would be pretty cool.
Now, obviously, like 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 we talked about, you were a relief pitcher and closer. Did you ever want to be a starting pitcher? Did that ever come across your mind, or did you want to stay as a relief slash closer? Well, my second round with the Rockies, when I went back there in 2005, um, you know, I had kind of talked to Davey Collins, uh, one of our one of our um, uh, first base coach about it, you know, and, you know, we, you know, we kind of chatted about it. You know, I was, we were a little bit down on starting pitching and I was like, man, I'd really like to give it a try, even though I, you know, never pitched more than about, I don't, I guess, you know, three and a third innings or so, but um, I would have, you know, I would have loved to try to be a starting pitcher. <clears throat> yeah. I think it certainly would have made me use all my pitches a little bit differently. Yeah. Well, yeah, without a doubt, for sure. I and mean, you probably would have, had to implement a new pitch possibly, right? right? That's right. Since that's you right. were three, what would you say you were? Yeah, sinker, slider, fork ball, and I, and I had yeah. a good change up. I just never really threw it. So out of all the players and coaches you played for, especially when you were a young buck coming up in the majors, who helped you along the line? Uh, who who put you held, held you under their wing and helped you out the most? I know you had tons of veterans when you were, when you were just coming up, but who helped you the most in that locker room? Well, I think, you know, when I was younger, I would definitely say Darren Holmes, Mike Munoz, Bruce Ruffin, Steve Reed. Um, you know, I mean, even though we were close in age, you know, Daryl Kyle was one of those guys that would, you know, it would, was always a really good teammate to everybody, making sure everybody was doing good. Um, Man, I would say everybody on that Rockies team, you know, uh, in 97, I mean, that was Blake Street Bombers. I mean, there were so many veterans there um, that was, you know, you, you were scared not to throw strikes because there were so many veterans on that team. But, um, yeah, I think those bullpen guys, you know, that I was in there with, uh, uh, Darren Holmes and those guys, Steve Reed and all, those were the guys that, you know, I really, you know, I tried to make sure that I took care of the younger guys you know, as I got older, like they took care of me. Yeah, that that actually leads me to my next question. I was going to ask about that towards the end of your career. Who'd you help along the line? Towards man, the end you know who I, what what the, the guy that I remember, and I tried to help everybody out in the bullpen, all the younger guys. You know, whether it was you know keeping them pumped up or giving them advice or you know wh- whatever it was. But um, you know, there was uh, uh, I think Darnell McDonald was with the Orioles and I, he may have been a, the, one of their first round draft picks or he was one of their high draft picks, super mm. talented, super talented ball player. Well, <clears throat> we were talking one day, um, you know, about, you know, normally an older guy will buy, you know, like an, an older bullpen guy will buy a younger bullpen guy, you know, his first, uh, first suit in the big leagues. Mm. And, um, you know, I was talking to Darnell about that. And he said, man, that, nobody ever bought me one. So I went and bought him, you know, I, well, he went and bought it. I just, I just paid for it. So that was, that was pretty cool. You know, um, even though he was an outfielder, wasn't a bullpen guy, you know, just, just take care of a good dude, good young guy like that. It was, it was pretty neat. Now I got to ask this cause I know about, I, I, I didn't play it, but I know about it. Um, and that, this is why I ask all my baseball guests this. Your rookie year, uh, did they have this back in back in when you played as well? I've I've heard tons of stories of players going through some kind of rigorous rookie year where the veterans would have the rookies all do something. Were you forced to do anything your rookie year? Oh yeah, the- yeah. They um, that John Thompson was a rookie with me. Uh, he was a rookie starting pitcher. Um, they dressed him up, <clears throat> they dressed him up like a, he had some sort of sequined bathing suit on. So he, he looked like some sort of, uh, weird looking cheerleader or something with his, with his red hairy hat. Um, and they dressed me up as baby Huey. So I had a big diaper and a rattle and a big bonnet on top of my head. So yeah, that was, and we went to, we went to, uh, Houston. We were on a road trip to Houston from Cincinnati to Houston. So by the time I got finished walking across that tarmac, you know, in the 95 degree heat and that asphalt, you know, my, my diaper was pretty full. Had a lot of sweat in it. I bet. I bet. <laughs> so I got, since I'm, since I'm a 
since I was born and raised here, oh, well, in Dunedin, of course, in Florida, but I'm near the Trop. Did you ever have a chance to play in the Trop? Because I've heard stories from other players to have that have pitched there briefly. That it's a dump to them. That it's a good pitch, good place to hit slash pitch. Did you ever have a chance to play at the Trop? Yeah, yeah, I, I pitched there a few times. I, I mean, I liked it. I didn't. You know, man, I was in the big league, you know, being in the, you know, whatever the ballpark was, I was in it, you know, and that, that was, that was kind of, I guess what I focused on, but no, I thought it was a nice ballpark. It was, you know, the, the, the turf was nice. The mound was nice. Um, you know, <clears throat> you know, wherever the cables or the catwalks up there, whatever, probably a little bit low, but, um, you know, I enjoyed pitching there. I thought it was, it was a nice place to be. Uh, how many times did you ever get, how many times did you ever get the pitch there? Do you remember? I was with the Orioles, I guess. Um, I think I was with the Orioles. The only time I would have been in there. I think I pitched there once or twice, I believe, you know, out of how many games we went there, you know, being in the American League East. That's true. Yeah. 16 times. I believe. Right. Yeah. Division rival. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, now I want to ask you about fan bases. Was there a certain fan base you loved the enjoyed the most is the one that got under your skin the most what what fan bases did you like and hate the most well i really i mean enjoyed you know i was in colorado for probably what six out of the ten years um really enjoy you know the colorado fans you know um you know would get to see them you know at home you know where, at my, where i lived and everything see them at the supermarket it was always fun talking you know talking sports with them and everything um <clears throat> Milwaukee, you know, that was just awesome. You know, that was some really cool. I'd never been to the Midwest like that. Um, you know, you know, they talk about beer, cheese and brats, you know, and some really, really cool Harley Davidson guys and everything. So uh, Milwaukee was really fun place to be. Uh, St. Louis, you know, it's top notch. You know, that's like, you know, baseball city USA. You know, fans are very knowledgeable, uh, even as a as an and as opposing pitcher, they treated you real well. And you know, they'd rag you, but they wouldn't, you know, be as bad on you as some other places. So, um, you know, the New York fans, man, when you're pitching well and playing well in New York, that's the place to be. You yeah. know, it, it was always pretty cool. But, um, yeah, so I don't know. You know, my favorite place, man, it's hard to say. You know, I, I, liked, I liked everywhere that I pitched. Um, you know, least favorite place, you know, those Cubs fans are pretty rough, you know, especially oh, yeah. if you've got that Cardinals jersey on. I believe yeah. that one, that yeah, rivalry, and the and you know Wrigley Field, they're they're right on top of you in the or they used to be. The bullpens are different now, but you know the fans used to be literally you know three right. foot away yeah. from you. So yeah, um, but um, you know in Philadelphia is always rough, you know, and that's you know that's what that that's what makes you know it's so fun to go there, you know, is because they're 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 die hard fans, you know, they they love their Eagles and they love their Phillies and. Uh, if you're playing against them, then you're on, you got the wrong uniform on. Now, your final game in the majors, did you know it was going to be your final game? Did you did you know you were going to retire right there, or did you want well, to play again? You know, I threw my, my last pitch was a ball four to Termel Sledge in San Diego at uh, at their new ballpark uh, when my when my shoulder started giving me that. trouble. Yeah, I'm a so, um, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I came, you know, I came back, rehab the back, arm was doing good, velocity was way up, everything's clicking right along, and uh, was getting ready to go through a simulated game, and all of a sudden, I'm not sure what happened, but, you know, my labrum tore, and, you know, that was basically the end of the beginning of the end. Yeah, and yeah, it sucks, because I'm sure you wanted to still continue to play, didn't you, as a player? Well, so you got yeah. You to quit. You know, and that's that's kind of what those bullpen guys and those veteran guys would always remind you. Um, you really never get in the game you want to get right. into the game the way you want to, and you normally exactly. don't ever get out the way you want. So, yeah. um, you know, I was fortunate and blessed to be able to play the time that I did. I get to meet the people that I met. You know, the the you know celebrities and other sports stars, and you know the Negro League players and uh, Reggie White. You know, there were just so many cool people, Muhammad Ali, so many cool people that you get to meet you know, that you can never really put a price tag on it anyway. So a couple more questions before I let you go, because it's getting late here and I know it's getting late over there. Um, did you, did you want to ever think about uh, 
after you left the game, did you want to give back to like maybe coaching, broadcasting, scouting? Did you want to do any of that? Well, you know, I had, uh, by the time I got done playing, you know, I'd had, um, I had two boys and one on the way. So, um, I knew I was going to be coaching and, and all that long enough. Um, my, my oldest son plays at ULM. Uh, now he transferred from Heinz community college to ULM here in Monroe. Um, mm-hmm. he plays third base. Um, my middle son is a sophomore at West Monroe high school here in town. And my youngest son's 14. He's in eighth grade. Um, now I have three stepsons. My oldest stepson is, uh, men's and women's volleyball strength coach at ULM. Uh, My middle stepson is a red shirt freshman tight end at ULM. (coughs) Excuse me. And my, um, my youngest stepson is a tight end at West Monroe high school. So, you know, there's the, 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 the coaching stuff is the ball stuff has never stopped for me, you know, from, Mm -hmm. from 2006 to this moment. Any chance your kids, have they told you, do they want to go pro or do they want to follow in your footsteps? Like no one is playing ball. You said, uh, yeah. your sport, and the other one's playing football. Have they told you if they want to make it pro? Is that what yeah, they my, want to do? That, that's what my, my oldest son, my oldest son and my youngest son, certainly that's what they're wanting to try to do. Um, you know, they want to try to, you know, see how far they can go playing baseball and everything. My, um, my middle son is, is really big into football. He likes football, had a, had a bad injury earlier in the year, but um, you know, so, you know, there, I think, you know, my oldest son and my youngest son definitely want to do something professional baseball wise. There you go. And I don't, that'll make you proud. One proud Papa. Hey, look, as long as they make good grades, treat people right and can, can, can pay their own bills. I'm, I'm all for whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah. Be there for their major league debut. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so that'd be great. So my final question to you is, it's a two-part question. For all the youngsters out there that want to play in the majors like you did, pitching-wise, what you mm-hmm. did, what would you give them since you're still coaching your kids? Well, you did coach your kids. And I'm sure they pitched a little bit before one decided to go position, position-wise. Yeah. What would you tell them? And the second part of the question is define your career in one word. So for the, for the young ball player slash pitcher, I would tell them um, you either are smart enough to get your degree, get it, or school's not for you. Um, there's got to be some sort of trade that you can do or you're interested in, whether it's welding or plumbing or, electrical worker, you know, electrician, um, game warden, you know, law enforcement, you know, whatever that is, always have that to fall back on, you know, because you can't, you can't buy time, you know, you, you can either, you can either get it or you can lose it, but you can't, you can't buy it. So, um, you know, make sure that you have something to fall back on. If something happens in baseball, you have a career and an injury, um, or it doesn't, you know, you just don't perform. You just don't, you know, live up to your own expectations and you have to, go another uh, way career wise, you know, have, have that safety net to fall back on so you can make a living and take care of your family. Um, to sum up my career in one word would definitely be blessed. There you go. I couldn't have said anything better. So I thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'll send you the episode as soon as we get done here. That way you can share it as well. Thank you for sharing it as well. So we hopefully have YouTube viewers, whatever, from your pages. Hopefully, hopefully, cross our fingers. <laughs> there you go. Come on, YouTube. Let's go. But it was fun. I had a blast. You're more than welcome to come on anytime you want. I got your contact info. And yeah, but let's do this again sometime. And I'll I stay pre- in touch. I appreciate you having me. Good, good luck. You guys have a great weekend. Yep. Same to you. All right. Stay safe out there. Okay. All right, buddy. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye.